Hello and welcome to uh, welcome to 2022. Actually, um, uh, no, you're, you're not the person to welcome everyone to the year. <laughs> well, you Who guys, is? you guys said I should be presenting, so <laughs> not the year. <laughs> welcome to our first episode of 2022. <laughs> is that better? Yeah. Yes. Continue. <laughs> uh, I am your host. I am Phil, and with me, as always, we've got a full roster. It's Sarah and Rosie. How are you guys Hello. doing? Hello. I'm Hola, right. ¿qué tal? I would like to start the year <laughs> off with a retraction. <laughs> oh, no. The last episode we did, yeah. as is customary, was our top five of the year, of the previous year. Okay. Oh, and we um, were all naked. I don't remember that. <laughs> uh, we were all in the same room. I'm sure I would have noticed. Oh, God. No, I'll take it back. Um, but I um, based on Rosie's top five three of which I hadn't seen Mm. I watched Come True on Mm -hmm. New Year's Eve Mm. had I seen it sooner (laughs) Mm. it would have been on my top five right so at the risk of my partner leaving me I am going to evict Psycho (laughs) Goreman and replace it with Come True it seems only fitting I'm taking out one Canadian horror film and replacing it with another. <laughs> and Except you're taking one out one synth. that I don't like and putting in one that I really like. I'm not doing it for you. <laughs> you sure you're not? <laughs> yeah, okay. I, no, I ordered it on Blu-ray. I liked it that much, so I'm very it's, excited I to mean, see it again. The fucking soundtrack for a start. Yeah. I think it would make such a good... I, and I, I hesitate to say this because it's a film that we name drop a lot. Are but you going to say such a good double bill with you know it? Go on. The guest? No. <gasps> Ooh. <laughs> I was going to say it would make an excellent double bill with It Follows. Oh yeah, it would. Actually, I would of happily the... put all three of those together. Yeah, I mean, there's big sort of retro influence on all of them, and Come True has that interesting like anachronism. Not entirely the, sure yeah. what time it's in. She has a phone, but the rest of the technology is analog. What's yeah. going on? Mm. Ooh, very interesting. <laughs> Phil, yes. get on it. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> right. So that's how I am. <laughs> how are you, Rosie? <laughs> well. <laughs> are you I... also going to wreck on your top five? <laughs> <laughs> Rosie's putting Psycho Gorman back in. <laughs> <laughs> um, medically speaking, I'm very sleepy. But apart from that, okay. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allowing myself that because the doctor told me I was um diagnosed sleepy. Diagnosed sleepy. Yeah. No, something something's going on with my blood and it's making me very tired. But that's fine. That's not a problem. You're a it's, it's getting sorted. I might have porphyria. No. No. Oh. Anemia. Is that is that the same thing? <laughs> no. Maybe you are a vampire and you need to get red blood cells by uh killing and drinking people's blood. Have you tried? <laughs> I haven't given it a go. Um because well. I'm well, I am vegan, so by and large, unless it's a consensual giving of the blood, then it would be exploitative. Babe, the internet exists. People are, will offer themselves up for anything. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not going to fucking Germany. Come on. <laughs> so Armin Mivers can put you in touch with somebody. <laughs> um. Yeah. No. I'm good. I'm good. I uh, am creeping into this year with little baby steps. Um. To try and not make any loud noises. Yeah. Cautious is. A good shout. I think. Yeah, I might or, go so far shout. as to throw a rock over there to distract mm-hmm. the year, and then just scurry on past it. Yeah, just we've got to make it through. Solid plan with whatever means necessary. It's just you know, it's it's feeling really twenty twenty one at the moment. Um, I it's gone by in a blur. We're nine days in. It feels like December the 40th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> Except I went back to work, so... <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Yuck. But we're over oh. a week in and I'm not feeling it so far. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. <laughs> but there, it may change. Who knows? Mm, fuck your fucking ideas up 2022. <laughs> um, Phil, 
How yes. are you doing? I am fine. I How have nothing to report. <laughs> oh, I'm always tired. Yeah, I know. We know it. That's why you're not allowed I've to c- say it anymore. Come out, I've somehow <laughs> come back from Christmas break feeling more tired than when I started it. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it's because of all the chaos. Like, how did that happen? I was fully expecting, right. like, a nice, relaxful Christmas time and plenty of naps and plenty of sleep. And, no. A, relaxful. <laughs> <laughs> that does not bode well for this show. <laughs> B, uh, you have a child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At what point did you think this would be a nice, relaxful Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> Well, did I you just my, think she'd nap parents. through it? It's like my parents. I just figured they'd pick up the slack. <laughs> In stark <laughs> contrast, I did nothing all oh, Christmas. So envious, really. I, 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 it's the first time I slept all year. I had two weeks of like getting up at midday every day, uninterrupted sleep. It was bliss. As love soon it. as I had to set an alarm again on Monday, fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I love that for you, though. I love that you had two weeks of like actual it was sleep. Great. It was great. And I overate. I took off my Fitbit. I didn't... I you were going to say you took off your trousers. They don't fit anymore. <laughs> took off my trousers. I overate. I didn't take them off. I just undid, undid the, top the top button. button. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, old, we... the old Christmas striptease. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. It was the antithesis of sexy. <laughs> I guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as some of you may or may not have seen, uh, we have Scream 5 being released soon. Next we week. And that's sometime. the film where... No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> we have gone through time to bring you a review. No, we've gone rogue. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought we'd get on the, uh, the, uh, the hype train a little um, and pick a film this time by Wes Craven. Wait, um, you could have said I think we, we got in the Wes Cray van. <laughs> <laughs> I might just edit out my clip and just do that, like, take that joke for myself. <laughs> I'm so right sorry. There. <laughs> I want to get a van and call it Wes Cray now. <laughs> Transit Van Halen. Come on. Also, how dare you suggest that we're not always on the hype train? <laughs> always on some that. form of train or another. Yeah. <laughs> Gravy, hype, who knows? Ne- Any- never literal. <laughs> no. Always remaining very much in place. Uh, we have chosen this week to cover the people under the stairs. So, whose choice is this one? Not mine. Sarah's then. <laughs> it's not it that I don't like the film, I've just never heard of it. Well, in all honesty, that's one of the reasons I chose it, because it's I've not... never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, because a lot of people have never heard of it. It's not one that gets talked about very much, um, which surprises me, especially as I'm sure we will get to in light of, um, like, Jordan Peele's films, stuff like that. Um, mm. In terms of the sort of social commentary that this film touches on, it amazes me that it's not talked about more. So we are here to do exactly that. It seems to be the case that the people who have seen it and do talk about it are pretty much entirely 100% plus this film. Yeah, I was surprised actually when we posted about it on social media. We got some pretty loud enthusiasm for it. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm just know, like Cult classic? I would cult, say, cult yeah. Hit? I think so. I think it kind of bombed on release, so yeah. It's got all the makings of a cult classic. It, um, it didn't, actually, from oh, what I... No, uh, it, it, the budget was six million, I think, and it grossed 24 nice that's that's not bad actually yeah so it didn't bomb but it wasn't like a blockbuster hit kind yeah. of thing i think it did okay i think the right people saw it and mm. probably saw it again yes mm. but um i think worldwide it grossed like 31 million and in the us and canada it's 24 okay hmm. um hmm. i 
No. <laughs> you started that sentence very confidently. I started off the sentence very confidently and then I was like, no, something else has to happen first. And I couldn't work out what had to happen first, so I just lost all of my words. Um, Interesting. Does anybody have a synopsis? <laughs> I have a film. synopsis. That's so funny. I have a synopsis. <laughs> what? Oh my God. What are we you, should, you should totally read that out. <laughs> I'll do that. Oh, and then I'll go, like, we I... found it. <laughs> right. Um, the writing on my DVD is very small and my eyesight is terrible, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> Wes Craven, the director of Scream and A Nightmare on Elm Street, locks you inside the most terrifying house on the street in this fast-paced horror thriller. Is Trapped it Elm inside... Street? It's not Elm Street. <laughs> Have you been paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> Trapped inside a fortified home owned by a mysterious couple, an impoverished young boy is suddenly thrust into a nightmare. Oh, they didn't skip a beat, though, with the use of the word nightmare. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> quickly learning the true nature of the house's homicidal inhabitants, the boy battles against sadistic security devices befriends an elusive and abused girl and finally learns the secret of the creatures hidden deep within the house. Stunning visuals highlight this inventive film that the San Francisco Chronicle calls Wes (laughs) Wes Craven's most satisfying movie. The San Francisco Chronicle? I can only assume they hadn't seen A Nightmare on Elm Street. (laughs) It's like, that'd be like the Herne Bay Gazette. Yeah. (laughs) Kent Online says... thought it was really good. Fucking hell. <laughs> yes, brilliant. Well done. Good synopsis. The kid, the, <laughs> the impoverished young man, mm-hmm. um, fool, yeah. yeah. His real name is Poindexter. <laughs> I know. I was like, who I names don't know a kid who? Poindexter? I don't know which name I'd be more embarrassed to be referred to as. <laughs> Poindexter. <laughs> Poindexter. I'd rather be called fool all the time. Yeah. Um, what I was gonna say was a little bit of trivia about him, which I found incredibly interesting. Um, I know Brandon what Adams say. was also in. Is it that he was in the, Mighty, the Duck. Mighty Ducks film? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love the Mighty Ducks movies. Um, Mighty and- Ducks is a very small but very sacred part of my childhood. I. Dan always makes fun of me that I can remember this, but I just love that Emilio Estevez's character was called Coach Gordon Bombay. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you know that? I don't know. <laughs> oh my <laughs> I just think it's the funniest name. <laughs> hey guys, how do you contact Emilio Estevez? Oh god. <laughs> you you use her, you use his Emilio Adrustevez. No! <laughs> Philip, <laughs> that wasn't Did you my just joke. come up with that? No. <laughs> she, I think you might have broken Sarah. She just went like hypersonic. I didn't do anything for Christmas, which means I escaped the awful cracker jokes. So I <laughs> guess this is my penance. Address to us is. I hate how much I like that. <laughs> So do I. <laughs> I really hate how much I enjoyed that. I also hate how much you liked it. <laughs> to be fair, I did send you a meme the other day that was entirely in French and, I and got made it me and cry <laughs> laughing. It took me a hot second to figure that out. Um, I will post that meme on the Instagram. Oh, just please do. I'll post it on the Twitter as well. Just to enlighten it's, it's everybody. Genuine genius. Um, <laughs> Back to Brandon Adams and his illustrious child acting career in the uh, seminal <laughs> child hockey films. I'm, well, okay. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that maybe what was more seminal was the fact that he was in quite a few Michael Jackson videos and films. Was he? Yeah, he was in, he plays Zeke in Moonwalker. Um, he was in the, uh, he was like young Michael Jackson in Badder okay. section of that. Um, he was in like a couple of his music videos. Yeah. He, he little bit too close to Michael Jackson almost. <laughs> Eesh. Yikes. Yeah. Less I mean, about that, the better. Yeah. There are, there are documentaries out there that can speculate far more than, than we are willing to do right now, <laughs> lest we get sued. <laughs> Finding Neverland. Um, <laughs> 
That's yes. interesting though. So he did he did do quite a lot of work then. I think he might have been in the Sandlot, the Sandlot Kids. I think it was not mm-hmm. even Yeah, he was. He did. It seems like he was super prolific up until about 1999. Okay. And then he did nothing until like 2005 where he uh, voiced one of the characters in Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> okay. Probably Amazing. spent six years in therapy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Re- I would imagine so. Or like, some sort of rehab centre. I mean, that's, a, the that's case a very <laughs> child, child star like life, isn't it? What? The, Incredibly the... prolific <laughs> until you become an adult and then no, no, no. The child no, no, actor that. to either drug addict or fuck up pipeline. <laughs> yeah, he Macaulay culkin it. <laughs> yeah. I, do you know what? I fucking love Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> I do as well. <laughs> On a slightly separate note, uh, Johnny's mm-hmm. been watching Succession. Not ma- oh, one of the Culkins. I think it's Kieran. Yeah. It's either Kieran or it's the other one that's not Kieran or Macaulay. It's not Rory because he's the youngest one. I don't know. It's it's definitely not Macaulay. He's the that's one that was in Lords of Chaos. But I've seen like a five minute clip of it, and it look it looks awesome. It looks very yeah. good. I need to start watching that. Well, um, I it's on my binge list once I'm same. done with the latest season of Dexter. Same child actors, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Who knows? We we're, we're speculating. He maybe came away um, unscathed. Who knows? Maybe he pulled a Rick Moranis and just went. Do you know what? I'm all right. I'm all yeah, right with what I I've done. So. Don't want to do it anymore. I'm out, guys. Peace. Or maybe he went the Mara Wilson route and is writing for some sardonic online yeah. <laughs> journalism website. Some like pithy editorial <laughs> pieces. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> you could do anything you want, Brandon Adams. We believe in you, fool. <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't sound right. I'm sorry. It doesn't. Oh, would you prefer I say we believe in you, Poindexter? <laughs> Bringing it back to the film. Nice. At one point, his, like his mum calls him Dexter at one point. And I was like, ah. Oh. That would have been a way more obvious choice. Poindexter. Nope, that's his name. Is that like, is that an Bigger actual sister's name? Called, Bigger sister's called Ruby. Why is he called Poindexter? Because they hate him. <laughs> But he is, he's a rad little kid. Oh, yeah, he's awesome. He's got, like, attitude coming out the wazoo. <laughs> and he wants to do the right thing at whatever cost. As noted by the final track in the film, <laughs> do the right thing. <laughs> I mean, nobody's saying this film isn't on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, that track was recorded specifically for a Spike Lee film that came out two years earlier, was cool. never used. The right and thing. then Wes Craven <laughs> went, I've got a good Yoink. idea. <laughs> Lads, I've got an idea. <laughs> Having it. And, um, and it fits, it's perfect. <laughs> It's, uh, I think it's... Oh, go on. No, I was, I was moving the conversation on, so if you wanted to continue through then... Well, I, I was just going to like, kind of add to the conversation about Fool. Um, it was kind of unheard of at the time to have um, a black protagonist that, mm. I mean, not only is the centre of the movie, but survives the whole film. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I, it's, the, it's the kind of like joke that the black dude dies first, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It became like such a i was gonna say meme became such a trope that it was sort of it had the piss ripped out of it and stuff like scary movie and Mm. you know um i want to say not another team movie but and that you know that gives i mean obviously i've never really agreed with the trope anyway but it gives this impression that the, the black character dies first because they make the worst decisions because like what that they're not as clever as the final girl no fuck that like yeah, I've, I've never liked that trope i've never and it sort of suggests that their presence is just some sort of box ticking exercise for yeah diversity. like they're, they're arbitrarily rather than actually being part of the film like yeah, it's tokenism they... isn't it yeah absolutely they're not there for the audience to get invested in whereas this like a whole year before Candyman, which yeah because yeah, this will... is what 91 uh, yeah, 91. I will mm. say neither of those films kind of... They both sort of portrayed, and I hate this term, but the ghetto in a very unfavourable, not necessarily 100% accurate light. Um, but yes. obviously, 
I think I would argue that The People Under the Stairs does it better because we get a lot more insight into their lives than we did in Candyman. Yeah, I mean, what you also <laughs> get um, sort of skipping to the near end but not spoiling it is a very massive sense of community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yes, the the area that he lives in, like this ghetto, ungentrified area that he lives in, is like he basically lives in a crack house, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, it's very, very stereotypical. Yeah, and it's completely the on the nose, and it's very like obvious. Mm-hmm. But then there is this like massive sense of community and people wanting to build a better society for themselves, like yeah, which absolutely. is much more favourable and I think much more honest representation of Mm -hmm. what it was like to live in those areas yeah definitely definitely and i i love that um even like ving rain's character for example is that leroy Mm -hmm. he's he's not just black he's like unapologetically black like the the traditional kind of african clothing that he wears it's just i love it like he's fucking great i mean the fact he is an asshole though oh he's not great (laughs) <laughs> but again like you see kind of the the black characters in this film sort of run the gamut as they would in real life you know what yeah. i mean we get yeah altruistic people we get more selfish like that's that's how it is um there are there are still stereotypes but i think it's the representation is done in a far more nuanced way in this film and we see a larger breadth of character types mm. yeah no i agree I absolutely I agree. It was rare at the time. I th- I think that without people like Jordan Peele, it would still be quite rare now. Oh, I'm sure it would, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, granted, I'm not the person to ask about black cinema. No, but... none of us are, but, but there's but... only the three of us talking about it at the moment, so <laughs> exactly. go for but, it. But, like, the names that sort of spring to mind are people like Tyler Perry, who's kind of a laughing stock because he makes those kind of shitty movies that mm. are basically, like, um, I don't know, in the same vein as, like, The Naughty Professor, for example. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, those Medea films. Um, and that's not really representative of, A, what all black audiences want to see, and, B, it, it's not a very diverse representation from my understanding but the fact that i can't name many more is troubling yeah no i no i get you i absolutely understand and and maybe that's um on us not yeah doing our research basically yeah as well as we should have done but absolutely i think it's a problem and i'm not saying it's like a well obviously part of it is a societal problem Mm. the rest of it could be personal who knows and even in this instance it's still directed by a white dude (laughs) this is it this is it's this is why even though this is like it's quite nuanced it's for a large part quite respectful of like a black audience and black characters obviously it's a black protagonist and Mm -hmm. you rally for them as well like you feel so much for the black characters in the film the white characters are the police and the family who are vilified and rightly so because they're all awful yeah Um, absolute villains but i think the reason why the ghetto in its inverted commas is you know like flaming bins and crack houses and everything is because it was directed by a white guy and it had yeah. to be made really obvious and on the nose because mm. he knew that a large audience that were watching the film would be white would also people. be white, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not saying it was like... Inc- <laughs> incorrect is not the right word. I'm not saying it was like wrong to do that and to mm. portray things in that way, mm-hmm. um, but it was spoon-feeding to an yeah. audience that needed spoon feeding mm. to i guess yeah absolutely i think i understand what you're saying like it... i'm talking about it in a really ham-fisted way <laughs> no but... I, I i understand i think um i think it's still great that he did it and that he centered black characters yes but yeah, ultimately 100%. perhaps he wasn't the best person to to do it. it but but it doesn't take away from the fact that 
it's still a standout in the genre in terms yeah. of representation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what I've always really liked about Wes Craven's films is his ability to inject just that little bit of like slapstick and humour into what could potentially be a really dark and serious subject matter. Like, because, I mean, think about what's covered in this film. There's... Oh, yeah. I mean, do you there's think some that's... really dark stuff in the film. Do you think that's to make it more palatable? What, to sort of add a bit of brevity? Yeah. I think that um, it's something that he does in a lot of his films. Mm. I think I think that most, if not all, of the Wes Craven films that I've seen have had moments of brevity within mm. them and funny moments. And I guess that's to temper the subject matter because, I mean, in this film especially or at least in my memory like what we're touching on race relations crime child abuse Mm -hmm. um there's a point at which you realize that's also sexual abuse cannibalism Mm -hmm. cannibalism yeah uh murder um entrapment kidnapping animal abuse animal like there's so there's so the, much that's going the only on thing in the that's film that, me so far. <laughs> yeah there's so much in the film that could be construed and is so dark and oh yeah it would be potentially dark. really triggering mm. that without those moments of light-heartedness it would be mm. a really difficult watch yeah, I, I mean, even Freddy Krueger, like, he's a child killer, but he's always wisecracking. <laughs> you know exactly, what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And, like, you've got this sort of plucky young kid who... So just some of the lines that come out through this film, like the the um, woman going, Get him, daddy! Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, gross. <laughs> like, to, to temper all of the horrible language and, like, mm. use of the N-word, which I'm sure we'll get onto at some point. And, like, yeah, definitely. All of the really gross stuff. You've got hilarious dialogue within the film as well. Whether it's intentionally hilarious or not, I'm not sure. So uh, this is something I've never really been able to reconcile with Wes Craven's movies because it's not... The, you're right, it's not the only film he does it in. To me, I've not more more often than not. I remember his films not marrying horror and comedy particularly well. Like I think Nightmare on Elm Street is a bit of a uh, outlier because the humor comes from a singular character, and you understand that that's the character himself. Whereas mm-hmm. this and also Last House on the Left are dark, 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 dark. Oh, here's the comedic bits dark 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 you know it, they're just out of nowhere and i think that it has the effect of undercutting the message somewhat i think because i disagree like, with that i, I, I think I, yeah i respectfully disagree <laughs> okay i disrespectfully disagree now um, <laughs> i think with that specific example that you brought up of last house on the left i will not apologize for my love for that film and I struggle to reconcile why I love it because it's horrible. Yeah. It is just a it's relentless. It's a deeply unpleasant experience from mm. start to finish. But I think like his aim was to kind of comment on the the violence in media and how we are as a society becoming increasingly de- desensitized to these sorts of things. Mm, so yeah, by punctuating absolutely. it with humor and silliness and almost like um you know keystone cops <laughs> moments it uh, it highlights the the kind of oh this is really depraved and it, now i'm very uncomfortable because it, this I'm is i'm just not stick. sure you can put last house on the left in the same wheelhouse as any of the others well like mm. it, it it's weird because the, the i've watched last on the left maybe once twice at most Mm-hmm. Three times and... a craver. <laughs> <laughs> <Craven>. <laughs> the, the, the Would you the... call yourself a crave fan? <laughs> <laughs> no, not with a straight face. <laughs> um but the thing that jumps out to me, maybe it's just because I've referenced it so much, is the song they sing. 
Mm. And that's uh, like I, I kind of almost I'd almost <laughs> forgotten about the other bits of humor, but that's the thing that jumped yeah. out. And it's a film of like it's a dark film about rape and horrific events going on. But the thing I remember yeah. is the silly little jingle that the villains were singing <laughs> as they're like dancing around the forest. Yeah. What was your reaction to that? How fucking angry did that make you that that was the music that was playing or that they were oh, singing? Like, not at all. At that's least... my point. It, I, I think it. Did it not it, make you uncomfortable? No. Like it's it's not like um what was the uh, is it uh, Tarantino who did uh, Steeler's Wheel stuck in the middle in mm. pulp, was yeah, it pulp Fiction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Tarantino's, again, a completely different wheelhouse because the one thing that he's really good at, apart from liking feet, is <laughs> making... He's very good at liking his, feet. His, his soundtracks are his soul jam. Mm. Like, mm-hmm. he's incredible at soundtracks and nobody can say that he's Otherwise. not. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, so, sort of removing that from your argument from the beginning because it's not the same thing like nobody's saying that about Wes Craven but the I think the idea of having such ridiculous music behind such a depraved film or moment if you like um is that it's meant to evoke an emotion and that emotion by and large is meant to be kind of disgusted it's at the very least supposed to be like it's designed to be it's discomforting. Meant to be yeah. Jarring. I just, I just, I mean, yeah, jarring. I think is fine, but that's yeah. only because it's such a a hard switch from one tone to the next, and that's why I these films I don't take tend to get on super well with. How, how did that's it? Fair. It's that's interesting. Fair. How did it make you feel? Out of interest, I don't really remember. I, I just thought how it seemed a bit dumb. Like I understand the idea of like villains frolicking in their you know depravity. But the fact that it sounded like a, you know, kind of a, a, a kids show theme tune or something similar, it just it just seemed so out of left field. But I was just a bit like dumbfounded by it. I just. I, but I think that was part of his intention. Yeah, though. it's meant to be confusing. It's meant to be unnerving and it, disarming. It didn't, it didn't make yeah. me, it didn't ha- make me dislike them anymore. No, and no, it's, no, it's no, supposed no, no, to no. dislike them anymore. If anything, it's supposed to confuse you. It's it's that music being played in essence is nothing to do with the characters. Mm. It's to do with the overarching feel of the film. Yeah, the dichotomy is very intentional. Yeah, and like so, so he says anyway. <laughs> like I said, yeah. I, 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 maybe I need to rewatch that one because that's oh, that's the <laughs> yeah. Maybe my version, but that that's the that's the singular moment that I remember from that film almost outside mm. of anything else, any of the other humor, any of the other. I would of, like, be moments. really interested to find out if that was intentional. And 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 the same thing happens. Uh, I found the same thing with this one. It's like. Within the first half now, you've got, like, child abuse and, like, breaking and entering. It's, it's very serious, very serious kind of themes and very important, you know, perhaps messages that are being discussed. And then mm-hmm. the dude jumps out in a gimp suit. And I'm like, oh, oh, it's the it's the comedy. The comedy started. Because it's yeah. referred to... That's how I that's how I took it. I just it, <laughs> I definitely <laughs> to me to me there wasn't that there wasn't that it was so out of the blue that it just felt jarring and and it it didn't feel cohesive. It felt like two separate movies going on. We will talk about Gimp Daddy. <laughs> Please never call him that again. Please, Gimp Daddy is a subject you. we will touch on later. <laughs> well, what is his name, Ma'am? Uh, yeah. If you believe the credits, he man and no, he, woman, and lady? he's called Eldon. Actually, he he's is he oh. called Eldon? Yeah, I think um, it's a, like a letter on mailbox or something. It's called it, it's referred okay. to as Eldon, but they're it's called Everett Mummy and McGill, Daddy, right? Isn't it? it is, yeah, Everett McGill and I believe Wendy Roby, mm-hmm. and they Wendy were cast Roby, yeah. after Craven saw them in Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> which, yes, I which is love. amazing. Um, they <laughs> they've been in some other stuff together as well. I can't uh, say offhand necessarily what it is but it seems like them and was it aj landers that played alice aj langer who langer that's i it. was obsessed with when i was about 13 i can totally see that <laughs> i can so absolutely life, see that she was she will forever beat rayanne graff yes. from my so-called life and she was the coolest character i had ever seen yeah um, absolutely loved her and now she is uh the countess of devon <laughs> In in real life, she's That's the amazing. Countess of Devon, IRL. <laughs> I love that for her. That's my favourite fact. <laughs> Ever. I absolutely love that for her. 
Good for her. The thing is, Everett McGill, I know mm-hmm. that you'll recognise him from Twin Peaks. Yeah. Um, I recognise him as Stilgar from David Lynch's Dune. <laughs> right. Of course you do. I was like, I know that guy. <laughs> I, I know that fucking guy. What a surprise. Another David Lynch film, though. <laughs> what a sp- you've had that weird, tall, wide, scary looking man in both. Twin Peaks and June. <laughs> <laughs> and put him in a gimp suit. No, no, that was Wes Craven. Sorry, my bad. I don't think... Well, David Lynch may put somebody in a gimp suit. I don't know. I don't... <laughs> I, I, would you put I him past put, him? I was about to say, I wouldn't put anything past that strange man. I love him, but he's not all there. <laughs> <laughs> um, There are... Okay, let's let's talk for a second about uh, troublesome dialogue because I, okay. I just I, I think it's important to talk about it, but I want to touch on it a little bit just because again, like we're not the right people to be talking about stuff like this, um, mm-hmm. but it's an important thing to talk about. So right at the beginning of the film, um, lady, Miss Lady, mm-hmm. what should we call her? Well, they're just called man and woman. Man and woman. So woman yeah. um, is talking about uh, clean people. Yeah. Mm. Talking about getting Yikes. new people into the building that, who were clean mm-hmm. um, and evicting these families out. And let's be honest, by and large, they are black families. So that that already is an incredibly like problematic sentence. It's a very evocative sentence. Of, mm-hmm. And it brings back images of old school Disney cartoons of the baby oh, being God. washed white mm. and yeah um like the water turning black and the baby comes out white kind of thing like awful awful <gasps> imagery well, Disney was a racist <laughs> with that and a Nazi no and, uh, and other news and now he's been frozen <laughs> um he's uh Poindexter's fool's uh, older sister is mm-hmm. a prostitute um, which again, incredibly on the nose, absolutely unnecessary to the storyline. Um, yes, I would agree. Do not know why Wes Craven wrote that in. No, her profession makes absolutely that it makes no bones to the story. And and all. the fact that it's Leroy saying that she's turning tricks on the strip. Oh, great. Yeah. Like like, what was the point of that? Or was that for flavor? Because <laughs> it's <laughs> shitty flavor. If it was. I mean, it's not great because obviously people turn to sex work for very, very different reasons. Yes. There are uh, any number of reasons people might choose that profession. But I think, especially kind of 30 years ago, the overriding stereotype was that people only did it out of desperation. Yeah. Mm. So I kind of, in that context, I understand. I mean... Yeah, it was unnecessary. Their their situation is visually obviously desperate Mm, and the fact that her mother is sick in bed makes it obviously desperate because it's her and a bunch of children essentially Mm -hmm. and and Leroy says your family's getting evicted because they can't pay the rent and they need to pay triple like it's 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 obvious without adding in that little bit you know like it it doesn't I I felt it was unnecessary anyway Um, I agree but I think a lot of this film is quite heavy handed yeah yeah um (laughs) I mean, at one point in the film, uh, man, Elgar, uses mm-hmm. the N-word. I think that's like in the first 10 minutes. Yeah, And while I hate is. the use of it, and hearing it from a white person makes me like... Oh, I just want to put your fist in your mouth. It gives me a visceral kind of cringe. Yeah. Um, I think it did its job in that scenario it told us everything we needed to know about that character and how exactly. loathsome he was exactly i was i was about to say like in sort of direct counterpoint to useless information mm. that one word because it's so evocative and mm-hmm. because it's so problematic like the the fact that it was him using it at that time in front of his wife um mm-hmm. in front of his child and having no visceral emotion himself around using it 
Well, I don't know if I agree with that because I would say he almost like spits the word out in derision. Like so, there is some emotion there, but it's very negative, which again tells us all we need to know about him. What I mean when I say doesn't show emotion for it is that it doesn't, he's not, um, what's the word I want? He doesn't think he doesn't twice about dropping yeah. it. Yeah. 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 It's clear it's not the first he's time he's said that word. That, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Um, and he, it's a throwaway line as well. Some X word mm. has been on our property. Mm -hmm. Talking about them like as if it was a rat or something. Mm. Which, uh, yeah, it tells you everything you need to know about what a horrible, heartless person this man is. Mm -hmm. And the fact he's a landlord and all landlords are bastards, <laughs> yeah. am I right? <laughs> yeah. Can I get it? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I mean, my landlord's really lovely. Sorry, Valentino. <laughs> Mine isn't. <laughs> I mean, fuck your landlord. My, my one's great. <laughs> and we're coming up to the point where I need to re-sign my tenancy. So please don't kick me out, Valentino. I love you lots. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, there is... Uh, there I is a point in the film. Is, is that the only utterance of that weird word? I think it. That's yes. what I remembered. Yeah, that's that's yes. the only time I remember hearing the it. The only yeah. time, and I think that's good. really good because mm. it emphasizes it posthumously. Yeah. All well, like I said, all we needed was that to know everything we needed to know about that character. I think overuse of it would have been gratuitous and would have undermined the entire message of the film. I think that's yeah. why I was asking. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And you find out as the film goes on that this guy is like thick as fucking oatmeal. <laughs> um, he spent is... too much time in the gimp suit with his oxygen being restricted. Right? Um, <laughs> gimp daddy. <laughs> oh, stop it. <laughs> and he talks to his dog like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I just, my favourite bit, I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but my favourite bit of this character is after he thinks he's killed Poindexter and he's oh going, God. I got him, I got him, I got him, I got him, I got him. And he's like doing a little <laughs> jig while he's going, I got him. That's my, fa that's my favourite part from that guy because he's just <laughs> wearing half of a gimp suit <laughs> with a gun. <laughs> I got him, I got him. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most Republican thing I've ever seen. <laughs> In it though, fucking hell. Um, did anyone notice when um what's his face? <laughs> oh that one. I say what's his face? The the crook what dies first. Right, yes. Because none of them have names that I can work <laughs> out. Oh, he definitely has a name, but it's not very memorable, <laughs> obviously. Because <laughs> he Let's... says it again when he finds, when Poindexter finds his corpse in the yeah, basement, right? Spencer, is it? Spencer. Is it? Right, yeah. okay. Um, Spencer, I don't know if it was, like, intentional. I think it was intentional. I think it was a bit of a Easter egg. When Spencer's walking up to the building to go in, you get mm -hmm. a top-down shot of him walking along the path... Mm -hmm. And just out of sight, like in the periphery, on top of the balcony, is a couple of pairs of handcuffs. <laughs> yeah. Like outside on the balcony. And I was like, huh. Are they meant <laughs> to be there? Because it's all locked from the outside. <laughs> is that... I, don't I, couldn't it. I couldn't work out if it was intentional or not, but I feel like because they specifically did that shot looking from the top down, mm. that it must have been. Mm. Yeah. I mean, maybe it was just... Maybe they didn't, yeah, maybe they didn't think about the logistics of how they got there. It was just more of a show, don't tell. They just like, yay! <laughs> yeah, foreshadowing about these characters. I don't know. <laughs> I love that for them. <laughs> <laughs> I also need a door with a tiny door inside it. <gasps> I got that note. I got the note. I just said, I want a door with a window panel. <laughs> <laughs> it's a door with a tiny door. <laughs> um... I want to talk about um, this film's unsung hero in Roach. Oh my God, I love him. <laughs> this kind of jump-started a weird genre career for Sean Whalen. Like, he's still making bank off 
convention appearances. <laughs> really? And it all started here, to the best of my knowledge, anyway. Um, That's awesome. But he's very memorable without a single line. <laughs> he is. Yeah. No, I was just thinking, no, he doesn't talk at all, does he? Because he's had a... Spoilers, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I it think anyone who's listening to this show at this point <laughs> is aware that we talk about spoilers. Oh, it's, yeah, it's kind of a and joke. And it came out point. 31 uh, years ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, a decade, right? I didn't want to say it. <laughs> came out nine years ago. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, Rachel's had his tongue cut out, so he can't say anything. Yes, of course, that's right, of course. But he seems really happy with his lot. <laughs> Surprisingly so. <laughs> He's um, quite cheerful, really. I mean, he's happier than the rest of them because he's sort of got a full run of the house and the rest of them don't. I was a little bit gutted (laughs) when they're running through the walls and, like, they run into his bedroom, I guess, and Fool's like, oh, is this where you live? And he's like, "Uh uh-huh. And then they just run (laughs) off and you never see that room again? (laughs) I I, want to see his bedroom. I want to see what he's nicked from the house. (laughs) I wonder if there would have been more of that that maybe hit the editing room floor. Probably, but I think that's such a shame. Mm. I think this is one film, and I don't say this very often, I think this is one film that actually could benefit from a director's cut. I would love that. Oh, with more stuff in it? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm. For sure, because that was clearly a set that had been built as well, and then it got maybe like a second and a half of screen time. Um, When they were running through the walls... All I could think about was that Britney Spears music video. Which one? This, I don't, I'm going to have to... I'll put that on Instagram as well. <laughs> I'll have to do some sort of side-by-side video because it was hilarious. Oh, is it the I'm a slave for you? I don't know. Mm, I don't think so. There, was no, there wasn't a snake, <laughs> to the best of my knowledge. <laughs> It's I'm the not, only Britney Spears song I can think of at the moment. I was gonna, I'm not some sort of Britney historian, okay? I don't know. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> what we were talking about the other day about Britney Spears being a bit... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She is a little bit unhinged, isn't she? I'm worried let's, about her. Let's save that for the mini-sode and we'll do a Britney, a small Britney intervention, shall we? <laughs> let's yes. come back to this next week. A and I mean that. <laughs> Put a pin in it. I want to talk about this more. <laughs> Don't put a pin in Britney. <laughs> Not literally. <laughs> Leave Britney alone. Um, the music in this film is freaking oh, awesome. No, right. In the Disagree. way... Disagree. No, there is one point which you have to agree is fucking brilliant. The music in the film is shit right up until the point where it gets really scary music and it's mm-hmm. the same strings and like discordant strings and that you get in labyrinth fuck off that's my note literally that's the same note the whole time i was and i've never clocked it before i haven't seen this film in about 10 years and it's i was just so watching it and time, i was just like it? but the whole time i was just like this is the same as labyrinth what's right? going on <laughs> with the with it's the identical. like um, discordant strings like traveling down into like blah 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 yeah but it didn't fit in this film. Like, and I, I love this film, but this is this is one of my criticisms. It felt too the music was too big. Yeah, it was oppressive almost. It had too much of a bearing on what was going on. I didn't didn't care for it. I think maybe <laughs> I think maybe the reason why that was chosen was because the characters that live within, well, like the man and the woman. Mm-hmm. That run the house. Their characters are much larger than life. Oh yeah, I would say. Mm. And it's almost that... it's almost like the house is alive as well because they've set up so much weird shit going on inside it. Yeah, um, yeah. For a film that does deal with some really kind of dark shit, as we have already stated, mm. it is. And the only thing, the only word I can think of. It is zany as fuck at times. It's, it's very Home Alone esque. It's like, but the wrong way around. It's like a r- really, really dark horror film mm. meets Scooby Doo. Yeah, yeah. That's, Except... that, but that's what 
It's like, here's some child Except abuse. Except he rips off Zoinks. his gimp mask and goes, I would have got away with it. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was the ghost all along. <laughs> But that's yeah, the reason why know. I'm not keen on it, you know, it, it, because... <gasps> Do you not like the film? <gasps> you, you've I'm waited to like an hour. <laughs> but do you not like it? <laughs> oh, uh, not, I mean, it's fine. I didn't rate it particularly oh. highly. Oh. <laughs> but, but, it, but again, it's the same thing. Like, it, I just felt like the message it was trying to portray was undercut by all the wackiness going on because all of a sudden you get caught up in the guy running around in the gip suit dancing around and... You forget, in a way, that there's actually a serious message about racial inequality going on. I would you, you have, have preferred maybe not, it? Maybe not forget, but like, would you just, have preferred it if it was a hundred percent straight film about racial inequality <laughs> and child abuse? No, I, just, I <laughs> no, I just would have preferred it to be more tonally consistent. Whether whether the comedy was woven throughout, because to me the comedy, the comedy doesn't... is woven throughout. Look at the He's dialogue. Called Poindexter. He's called Poindexter. <laughs> He <laughs> says that he wants to be a doctor and Leroy goes, a doctor of burglary, maybe. <laughs> lol, 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 lol. Like, the I comedy is consistent all the way through. What's not consistent is whether the comedy is from dialogue or from action. Maybe. But, yeah. e- but even then, that then there's still an inconsistency there. And I think that so What is... would you want from the film? Just more, more. I mean, more consistency. Just like more. I don't really, I don't really care if, about the, about um, the the man and the woman, uh, being wacky and zany. Like, but but then I think if it was a slapstick film all the way through and it dealt with child abuse and racial well, yeah, inequality, you'd have a big problem with that as well. But, but there's there's plenty of films that deal with dark subjects in a lighter way. I can't think of any right now, of course, but. <laughs> Um, but there are loads. I just can't prove it. <laughs> well, you, I oh, it's getting spot. controversial. I didn't, I didn't expect to have a backup <laughs> argument of everything. But you have to justify everything, <laughs> Philip. I'm, I'm genuinely interested. What would have made this a more palatable well, film for just, you? Just consistency. But that's the same with, like, like I said, with um, with what I found about um, about Last House on the Left. Again, it's just it just we're supposed to really hate the uh like man and the woman characters right or at least they're the villains of the thing they are yeah, yeah they're, they're detestable deplorable. people they are uh responsible for the um for a bunch of people being dragged downtrodden and left yeah. destitute and poor they're, and they're a cartoon version of the seven deadly but, sins but then they become then they be, then all of a sudden once the kind of like home invasion mo- uh, sort of section starts they become cartoon characters I like to, to me. To me, they they start off fairly sincere in their um... because you don't know them as characters, and then you get to know mm. them as characters, and then they're fucking idiots. They I become that... laughable. It's not like they become jokey, like likable characters. You still hate them, but they're laughable because they're so fucking stupid. But I didn't particularly well, hate them psychotic. as soon as like. Yeah, I the psychopathy is in, like peeled away throughout the film. I'll be honest, I'm I'm not saying I disagree with you. Mm. I think your your argument is completely valid. I fucking love the gimp suit reveal. It's yeah. not. Yeah, it's, it's so absolutely. far out of left field. I, I think like it's great. I screamed <laughs> when he ran out. I was like, <laughs> I like that. Like this, but all right. If nothing else, I agree with you saying it's tonally inconsistent. Mm, I do agree with you about that. And whether that's from dialogue or action or like dark moments and brevity, like fine. I think that was very, very much planned. And I think the reason Mm. it's planned is because from start to end, this film is a fucking roller coaster. Mm. Yeah. Like, and the peaks and the troughs are maybe a bit too peaky Mm. and troughy. Yeah. For what you like, yeah, maybe. I, I, I think, I think with di- it's perhaps the difference between kind of like uh, dialogue and and like action, like you kind of pointed out. Because with dialogue, you can be a bit more subtle and a bit more witty about things. In that, it's funny, but it still can be quite poignant, or it still can be have an important thing to say. But as soon mm. as kind of the idea of like wackiness and zaniness, zaniness comes in, it it just kind of feels a bit like it devolves in a way. Can, I think you, so. Sorry, can, I, can I just make a quick observation? Mm. Something that I thought of while I was watching it, and I wonder if maybe this affected your opinion of it a little bit, Phil. Um, 
like throughout the 80s obviously this is early 90s but the same kind of era yeah, throughout course, that yeah. time whenever we have a horror film where there is a child protagonist you expect a certain kind of film like that is the goonies or the monster squad or the gate or the gate yeah and they're all a little bit silly yeah and they're all kind of like what i would refer to as like intro horror mm. whereas this it has a child protagonist but it deals with some absolutely abhorrent topics mm. and i think maybe that is maybe that's sort of hard to vibe with maybe it's funny you should mention the goonies because i was i was kind of refreshing the the um plot of this because i watched it on tuesday mm-hmm. um and all of a sudden i was like the kids breaking in to get treasure and it, it like it reminded me of the goonies <laughs> and yeah and it's a it's a valid point and then but then you're right like it deals with these such a heavy it's almost as if cannibal holocaust for example and the goonies <laughs> were just jammed together like that's the vibe <laughs> i got from it and it just felt so at odds with each other that it, it just it, it felt confusing you know i think there's one scene that really ties things together for me anyway um mm-hmm. in terms of things being like you say zany or wacky and then like the really dark nature of it it's the scene where it's a split second shot of alice up against the wall pretending like her hands are still mm. above her head mm-hmm. and the man um in his gimp suit mm-hmm. not looking looking dead ahead knowing that she's to the side and just grabbing at his crotch Mm -hmm. and then making like a heavy breath out and then he's called away. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, made that gimp suit not very fucking funny anymore. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, but then it just just feels like what's kind of the point of having such zany madcap... So that Moments then you if... can, so that it tempers each other. I think you can't have the really low stuff without the really high stuff. Mm. I think if you did, it would drag the entire film down. In the same way that I think if you had the really high stuff without any of the like really hardcore storyline, mm. then it would make it a silly, silly film. Yeah, I yeah, I think you're I think you're right in calling it a roller coaster. I think that's a good way of describing it. However, I would say, unlike a roller coaster where you kind of, there's that slow ascension mm. and then the, a really big drop mm. once or twice. Yeah. This is just like up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. It's just a series of moments of kind of making you grin, or, you know, like a dad And then feeling moment, horrified. And then having the rug pulled out from under you again and again and again mm. and again. Um, so I completely agree with your opinion, Phil. Um, what I disagree with is that it, I, I don't view it negatively. I think it's totally inconsistent, but I still love it for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd be curious to go back to it a second time because mm. uh, with with the knowledge of where it goes in mind, it might actually mm. be that I can uh, see that. Not with a bit of expectation not, yeah, for not, not foreshadowing yeah. per se but you, you go to this mm. film you're completely uh, uh, like oblivious to where it's going mm. and it is a very dark film you know it deals with some really heavy kind of uh issues right out of the gate and yeah, it, i think it's, it's a bit p- like being slapped about but someone telling you jokes while they're doing it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it, it, it's, th- it's probably it's probably very easy to get I mean, maybe this is why i did i've got caught up in in that world mm. where it was it was this racial inequality uh you know rich versus poor thing and then it becomes this kind of like madcap home alone mm. you know house invasion thing and like i said with with the expectation in mind with with knowing where it's going it might be i actually appreciate like new light is shed on that introductory bit and mm. so that that yeah. kind of like point where he jumps out in a gimp suit and all bets are off um is less surprising you know yeah um i think it's interesting like i would describe myself as a realist so i wonder if you're perhaps more of an optimist phil (laughs) because to me um like i mean it's just kind of a given that a lot of stuff we've all had to deal with uh you know as a collective the past couple of years has been largely shit Mm -hmm. and i think one of the ways which a lot of us deal with that is to find humor in really dark situations one of the things i like 
at my darkest times, I'm able to laugh in a self-deprecating way because gallows humor is what gets me through. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons why I actually love the tone of this mm. film, but yeah. also why I recognize that you might see it as wildly inconsistent. Yeah. I get it. No, I, I get it. it. It's, I do. It's I'm weird. just like... My Sorry, questioning really. was more through genuine interest than trying mm. to like catch you out or anything. <laughs> no, yeah. of course. No, and, and like I said, it, it could just be actually the the context changes everything, and and going back again will change my opinion. Um, I mean, it's it is a daft film as well, and it's very nineties. Yeah, it's oh, so sorry, 90s. painfully nineties. <laughs> um, and a lot of it is quite cartoonish, mm. but and it's something we've talked about with a lot of other films as well. Like, I kind of think that's a really genius way of Trojan horsing in some of the issues in inverted quotes. Mm. Um, I think that's the thing. I think it's very easy to forget how, um, how much society has come on in the past like 30 years, mm. because you know, the, I'm y sure. Yes and no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like kind of what you mentioned earlier about this film being a white guy directed by a white guy. Um, mm. It, you know, it probably was the case. Actually, that's the only way they could actually tell a, or at least the only reliable way they could tell a, a story about black people, you know, mm. um, in a way that is palatable for I can't of think time. of a huge amount of like 90s black horror directors. Mm. <sighs> I'm trying to think of like, I mean, there, there's a handful of films that were mentioned in horror noir, like Eve's Bayou and Demon mm -hmm. Night and stuff like that. But there yeah. wasn't, there just wasn't a pretty huge few and far between amount of genre work. Yeah, and, and, and um, not not ones that are not films that have actually become, uh, you know, uh, present in modern society. You know, mm. what I'm also really interested in is how many horror films were made in the early 90s late 80s that were 100 percent straight um that didn't I have mean, any sort of like mad capery within it yeah because like 80s horror especially is super schlocky and really quite ridiculous but may maybe it was an interesting transitionary time into more serious horror mm. It's, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because mm. um, not to rattle on about Last House on the Left again, but I think it's really easy to forget that that was like early seventies. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and and actually, and actually, seventies horror was like super straight and played mm. really straight, and then it kind of merged into stuff like sorority babes at the slime ball ballorama <laughs> and and then that merged into like 90s horror and then obviously you've got scream which is in like early mm -hmm. early 2000s scream was 96, 96. Mm -hmm. fuck <laughs> oh. i know um i know but again where's craven again like, well, yeah exactly and and again like injecting comedy into i just i find it's a really interesting progression because now um and like the two 2010s and stuff saw some really quite serious horror mm -hmm. and i just just very quickly, I think it's really interesting that we sort of started off talking about Last House on the Left and then you go through to like Nightmare on Elm Street and then People Under the Stairs and then Scream. That's like three decades worth of Wes Craven not necessarily moving with the times, but dictating the tone of films. And it's doing his own thing and doing it really well. Like I know the term is overused, but to some degree reinventing the genre mm. time and time again. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's insane. I think particularly like because it because there's only three years between People Under the Stairs and um, a New Nightmare, you mm -hmm. know, and, and New Nightmare particularly uh, was a, a horror film about horror films, right? Yeah, you know, and I think that that did pave the way for a lot of uh, you know sort of films of that kind of that meta whole meta horror thing that went on. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I love New Nightmare. Mm. It's it's so funny sort of seeing it now. And looking at all the ways in which he honed those same ideas in Scream, it's brilliant. It's what interesting because it's such it's such a big gap to me. Like I was almost thinking that he kind of found his tone. Like he was he did you know thinking of of of, of people on the stairs and mm -hmm. Last House on the Left, and then comparing that to New Nightmare and Scream. 
I was like, oh yeah, he just he just kind of settled into his tiny found his thing and that's where he ended up. But actually, with only three years between them, it wasn't as if he just like gradually got there. <laughs> it just changed a bit in three just years, you know. Mm. <laughs> I think he's always he always had a very wry sense of humor mm. yeah. that was present in basically everything he did. Mm. It just manifested itself in slightly different ways, <laughs> depending on the film. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I and, I, and I love that as well. Like, yeah. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Because every one of his films is, for me anyway, is quite obviously like, oh, that's a Wes Craven film. Mm. Mm. Like, you can spot them a mile off. Yeah. Uh, and as, as sad as it is, in a way, I wonder if it hadn't been for the success of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street about, what, eight years prior, mm. would this film have even been made? Like, I can imagine if you'd sort of shopped around a script about a black kid yeah. from an impoverished neighbourhood in a film about, like, demonising white people. So, at the time, no, I don't think it would mm. have been. Um, no. But I saw on IMDb that this is being remade. Yeah. I saw that recently. But isn't um, Jordan Peele involved? Yeah. It's okay. being remade. Uh, the director is Orion James. Okay, that's not a name I'm familiar with. No, me either. Um, and I couldn't find an awful lot more information about it than that, but it seems like a straight remake. Um, okay. And actually the cover art that I've seen gives the impression that it's going to be a straight film as well. Oh, like, there's so not going to be quite humor. so much. There's not going to be quite so much comedy within it. Okay, interesting. It was... Um, um, so the cover... Could... So basically the cover looks very similar to the actual cover of the original... Mm -hmm. But they've almost like drained all the colour out of it and it's much more naturalistic looking skull. Okay. I'm game. I'm game. Um, and I think if Peel's involved, then it stands mm. to be a really awesome commentary. Yes. Yeah, I can't think of anyone better. He, not me either. Jordan Peel and Wynne Rosenfield, who are both monkey poor, um, were okay. signed on to produce. So. And I think, right, like, and I think you know, they, they would be. I would be very curious about what they do with with a remake of People mm. Under the Stairs. It's unusual that films get remade, and I'm like, "Fuck yeah, do yeah. it! I want to see what happens." <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, yeah absolutely. But I, I think the thing is, it's because we know they are directors that are that use their voice to um, address as a important. platform. It, as a platform, they and use it, the film as a platform. It's, yeah, it's not mm. just a money making device. Actually, this is a film that centers black people, and having a black uh, kind of production team behind it. Mm. is going to be all the better for it, you know? Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. It's, um, it's sad in a way that the themes are still so prescient 30 years yeah. down the line. But yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm excited is. to see what they do. Um, Definitely. It is, it is sad that that has to be the case, though. A couple, couple of things that I'd really like to touch on, because um, mm -hmm. I feel like we're nearing our <laughs> sort of natural <laughs> yeah. conclusion. Yeah. Um, I found it really interesting that the uh, husband and wife, who you you know, not husband and wife, yeah. um, uh, obviously religious zealots, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's only right at the very end that there's actually any iconography to suggest that. Okay. So all the way through the film, I've written here that the moral of the film is everyone can burn in hell. <laughs> Because that's all they fucking say. Like, they just say, <laughs> burn in hell. Everyone can burn in hell. Um, you burn in hell. <laughs> and then, like, ketamines, the creatures <laughs> living under the stairs, and then goes, ah, they can burn in hell. Um, <laughs> but, so, that was what gave me this idea. And, you know, the hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Yeah. Obviously, that has very strong mm. religious undertones and stuff. But it's only right at the end of the film where he goes into a separate room, which is lit by, like, hundreds of candles... Mm -hmm. And there's photos of children that's clearly been taken of kids um, through like chicken wire fencing, like you'd see in like school playgrounds or in the ghetto or yeah. um, black and white photos of like hundreds of children. Um, and then on the other side of the room, there's loads of uh, crucifixes. Right. Yeah. Like hanging from the wall. And it's that's mm -hmm. the only point at which it's made obvious that actually they are religious fanatics mm. and I, that it's interesting that you bring that up i would have preferred it if that had been peppered throughout rather than thrown in at the end but i think i would have done as well because it would have given a lot more 
Context. Weight and context. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Rather than, I think than just being fucking mental. <laughs> yeah, in hindsight, the characters do seem like they are being painted as people who would uh, cherry pick from the Bible to use for their own ends. Yeah, and they like put their daughter in scalding water to cleanse her, mm. um, and you know, like as as a type of baptism. Oh, oh which <laughs> one's that? I don't know. I'm gonna have to shut him out. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to have to <laughs> shut him out. I think you do know. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I just I I thought that was interesting and maybe not quite the right call to leave the iconography right until the very end. Because again, again, I think there's probably quite a lot of that that was left on the cutting room floor because it's an entirely different room, an entirely different set, and it's in the film for about two seconds. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny. I, I didn't make any notes on that, but I completely agree with that observation. I, it's one of those things where you clock it quite early on mm-hmm. that like oh they they seem like religious types <laughs> um and then it's just not confirmed throughout yeah. the film at all so you start sort of questioning mm. yourself and then right at the end you're like ah okay i was mm. right okay they do seem like the sort of bigots who would weaponize you know their beliefs for nefarious ends it's really interesting how much the story translates 30 years later when you have like big america with their guns and their religion Mm -hmm. and their gimp suits (laughs) and their gimp suits and their large dog (laughs) um and their handcuffs everywhere (laughs) just everywhere you can't (laughs) move for handcuffs (laughs) and the uh the fact that the brother, he like, he's absolutely convinced that Alice, at the first opportunity, has slept with the boy that's crept crept into their house. Yeah, she's a whore. Mm. <laughs> she can't help it. She's a whore. Um, Ugh. she did it with him. I know she did it with him. And w- like, when? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been chasing him through the walls with a fucking shotgun when <laughs> yeah they were not blessed with the time for a quickie they uh, and i think that <laughs> i think that alice's uh parents were not blessed with too many brain cells <laughs> well, that's what happens when you uh uh indulge with the same gene pool shall we say <laughs> yeah um but then you find out that she's not their kid at all yeah um, and they are actually just mental baby snatchers. Right, so baby snatchers. This was a question okay. I had. They get yep. called baby snatchers. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Where from? How? Well, the insinuation is that all of the, pe- the, you know, the people under the stairs are boys. Like they've been stealing. They're boys that are meant to be to procreate with Alice, I guess. Yeah, they want like the, you know, Adam, the perfect... Um, blank slate the mm. perfect man but mm. they're always disappointed so they're just left to fester and become cannibals and yeah am i am i remembering correctly that they kind of say that it's basically anyone who's broken in they'll just keep it's not anyone that's just broken in it's people who have entered the house because the idea is once mm-hmm. you once you enter the house you, you can can't get out yeah yeah um so it might be people who like have come Royston to do work Daisy. on the house or people who have tried to break in or people that they've invited in, I think, as well. Like, mm-hmm. they've brought boys into the house to try and be a perfect match for Alice, but then they've yeah. spoken or seen something they shouldn't have done or heard something they shouldn't have done, so they've had a various body part removed and then left in the cellar. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I just I can't help but get the feeling like... They're called baby snatchers. Where the fuck did they get Alice from? Um, I don't think because it's ever clearly long enough ago that she explained. doesn't. No, no, it's not, and I I find it a little bit flummoxing. Mm. Um, but I think that sort of lends weight to the whole. Well, particularly what we see towards the end, where they're able to maintain such a good social front that the police don't even suspect them of anything. They're just this nice couple who, yeah. you know. Oh no, we're it. troubling them by responding to this call. 
very poorly built house as well. <laughs> People just punch through the walls. There's an interesting goof, actually, when she's uh, looking out the window right at the end when all of these monsters are punching out through the walls and grabbing at her. Mm-hmm. One of them punches through the wall and grabs her from under the window. And it's like, that's outside. <laughs> that's literally outside. Why are you doing that? <laughs> I can't say I spotted that. I tell you what, one thing this film did make me want to do was rewatch Housebound. Oh, I haven't yes. realised the extent. I... Like I, I remember watching Housebound and thinking, "Wow, they took some heavy inspiration from the people under the stairs." But I haven't <laughs> realised how much until this rewatch. Mm. Yeah, I'd be up for doing that. Watch party <laughs> soon. I would Hell be yeah. interested to see, and it's, it just so happens that obviously we had the Christmas break. I would be interested to see. If having watched society more recently, this would have changed our not opinions per se, but would have informed more of our uh, thoughts during the recording itself, because oh. because they're quite similar. Are they? In terms of <laughs> so sorry, I missed. I must have missed the first part. Which films are quite similar? Society, society. in terms of like the <clears throat> mid nine like nineties era kind of. Uh, cartoonish horror dealing and with they were they're both very much social commentary dealing with social but i think commentaries. i think they're saying different was... things though oh for sure yeah, yeah they but are. i think that the whole social commentary angle was so prevalent in horror mm. throughout i think it's it's just because we, we perhaps have haven't really done it before had two films that are quite so um close in kind of message and uh tone eat the rich I mean, essentially, that's, that's yeah, the eat the rich. Uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, <laughs> maybe the answer is maybe yes. the answer is okay. it but <laughs> no. Uh, yes, okay. I kind of get what you're saying. I think that I am missing the part where they're very similar films, though. I I think that's kind of immaterial at this point. Shall we think about final thoughts? Yes. I've run out of notes. I say this because I have run out of things to say. <laughs> We know uh, Phil hated it. So Phil hate 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 so <laughs> hated everything about it. He hates Wes Craven. He never wants to see another Wes Craven film ever again. Uh, That's what rip. I heard. Yeah. He can burn in hell. It's Phil, in the film. It was so, a callback. <laughs> it was so cruel of you to say that, Phil. <laughs> Why would you say that, Phil? <laughs> what about you guys? I well, think, what, let, come on. What do you guys think? I think your criticisms are valid. Um, However, I love the film for a lot of the same reasons that you didn't love the Mm. film. And I think in terms of social commentary and ultimate message about um, the only way to kind of defeat the powers that be is to come together as a community is really kind of weirdly wholesome in the end. Yeah. (laughs) For a film that deals with such dark stuff. Um, Like I said, I think it's unapologetically 90s. Um, I think it's pretty well paced. I think the villains are really memorable. (laughs) And yeah, I think it's it's one. (laughs) Exactly. I just think it's one that really stands up to rewatches. I feel like uh, this is a film that I've already seen five times before. (laughs) Okay. In what sense? It's my first time watching it, but it has that, um, it has that really comfortable nostalgia that so many Mm. 90s horror films came out with. And I think maybe it's because I've seen a few Wes Craven films and it's so clearly Mm. a Wes Craven film as well, that it's like, it's com... I'm reticent to say comfortable (laughs) viewing. Yeah, but it's I, I um, it. in terms of being able to just sit and enjoy it. Mm. There's a familiarity. Yeah, that's comforting. definitely, definitely, mm. and um, and that's really easy to sort of sink into and watch, despite the really sort of heavy content within it. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually thought that the sort of more slapstick, uh, screwball moments were great i thought they were like super enjoyable and it was nice to be brought out of being quite horrified by what was going on inside the house it was it was nice to be sort of pulled out of that experience and then maybe pushed yeah. back into it again mm. and i would it, agree it does feel like somebody is almost physically directing you through the film as you're watching it. Yeah. Because mm. there's so much going on. 
Um, I I can't think of a point where I was like, oh, quite a moment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just all go all the time. Like I stick with it being a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Um, you're either at, you're either going up or down, or you're up or down. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, really enjoyable watch. I can't necessarily say that as much went in as would normally have gone into my tiny little brain. Mm-hmm. Um. But maybe that was a good thing. Maybe that just made it easier for me to sit back and really enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, and I trying think, to like take it to pieces, you know. Mm, I think my ultimate takeaway is that I can't, <laughs> I can't necessarily name, and this is a bold claim, so feel free to correct me if you disagree. But I can't necessarily think of another director who did as much for the genre as Wes Craven did. Yeah, not even Carpenter. And I, I was going to say the closest person I can think of is Carpenter. I wouldn't even credit. Carpenter with being quite as innovative. Uh, yeah. Um, so for that alone. I'm sorry, my <laughs> my cat is being a cat. Ow. Your cat's being a cat. He's doing my head in. <laughs> yeah, he's being a cat. Yeah. <laughs> Making his presence known, that's for sure. It's popcorn. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> it's not for you. <laughs> Oh, fuck. <laughs> Phil, yeah. final thoughts. I think I, I would be curious in rewatching it. Um, again, I, I don't think I'm shifting from my opinion about the humor taking away from the message. I think, you know, it's, it, it, in a similar way to, you know, people always think of Freddy Krueger being like one of the three greatest, you know, up there with the three serial, greatest serial killers of, yeah, of yeah. fiction. But because of the way he's portrayed as a wisecracking slapstick villain you kind of forget that he's a child molester in the process and and i feel the same thing is kind of happening he was, here he was only a child molester in the remake he was just a child killer in the original okay, don't well, you makes, okay don't you sorry yes. his good name. <laughs> i was trying to remember i couldn't remember but, but either way like the, the the point is it there's a really like horrific thing going on there mm-hmm. and i get that uh nightmare on elm street wasn't saying quite as much as people on the uh, people under the stairs but um, yeah, I just, I just, I just, I still feel that the the, the kind of comedy, the zaniness, takes a little bit away. So I'd be curious to see what they do with in the remake. But yeah, I it was it was fine. I thought it was fine. As a quick aside, I would argue that the most of the silliness of Freddy Krueger came from the sequels, and you was are right, not yeah. Craven's doing. You are right, and, and to be fair, you know, in terms of like Craven being. Uh, such an innovative director. I was thinking about this. You can probably trace a direct line from Nightmare on Elm Street to Cabin in the Woods. Oh yeah, almost you know, certainly. It didn't, it and didn't as, occur as you to were me, you know? just talking about like Freddy Krueger thing into the icons of horror, how many horror directors can you say created two of them mm. in Freddy Krueger and Ghostface? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's the only one. Incredible. Mm. Incredible. What a guy. What a guy. <laughs> yes, uh, and that's probably. As good a time as any to call it a day. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been great to be back with you guys again, talking horror films. Oh, um, loved it. Um, <laughs> guys, if you uh, enjoy what we do, come find us on Patreon. Two dollars a month, you can listen to twice the content. Uh, it's great. Also, find us on social media on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Where we update Ra- regularly. Radio Gore Press on absolutely everything, mm-hmm. so we're not difficult to find. Come say hi. Or you could just shout. Literally, it couldn't be easier. (laughs) Carry a pigeon. You could just yell into the void. We're often staring into it, so we can Mm -hmm. probably find you. Send a fax. Who knows? Uh, We might receive it. Come on. We're not savages, Sarah. I don't. Do you know what? I miss miss the days of the fax machine. In my last job, we had a fax machine. I really used to enjoy. How long ago that actually was? Since you've had had a a real job. With a fax machine. You. It's not a real you? job my if it doesn't mom? have a fax machine. Are you my mum? Doubting my career choice. I'm going to buy you a fax machine and buy me <laughs> a fax you? machine and then send you a fax of a drawing of a cock and balls. <laughs> Do you promise? Yes. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> You'd have to get I, an entirely new phone line, but yes. I want nothing more for Can't 2022. Can't I just email you? The year of our Lord, 2022, <laughs> I want... I would like a faxed cock and balls from my best friend, please. Right. 
If anybody's got a fax machine they can hit me up with and let me know. But other than that, I reckon that's the end of the show. That's what we're going to use the next lot of Patreon funds for. Ah, so shit. Up, guys. <laughs> right. Stay tuned for the next episode. I'm sure it'll be great. Can't remember what it's about, but it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to cover a film and it's going to be scary. Yeah. <laughs> so safe Until bet. next time, stay spooky. Oh, stay a spooky. <laughs> Peace.